And you're here in Paris because you were really one of the first Wall Street banks to say, look, in this Brexit world, this post-Brexit world, I want to choose Paris. Is, is this being vindicated? I'm not sure what vindication would be. Uh, so uh, post-Brexit, uh, we looked around, and this was a place that we put our broker dealer, our, our securities operations for Europe. And uh, we've gone up 10 times the number of people we had in 2019, and that's a relatively short time frame. And we're very happy here. It works well. Vanessa Holtz and the team run it under Bernie Menz's leadership, and they do a great job. And more importantly, thank you for joining us today. It's a great conference, and we're glad to have you here to help us spread the word and get the ideas that come out of it out to the market. So how, in this post-Brexit world, how do you see actually servicing your clients in Europe and how do you see the, the animosity that maybe uh, you know the two sides are getting closely closer in, in these Brexit negotiations? Well, you know, the Brexit negotiations are going to have a lot more to do than financial services, but the, our strategy from the beginning was to get operational, get our clients used to the fact that they're going to, what they call face off in the markets against different entities, get those entities stood up and, and uh, put together. So we have a UK broker dealer and our bank is branched in the UK and then we have our Ireland subsidiary and the uh, a French subsidiary, a bank, and a broker dealer. So you had to get ready to go, and so it'll work out over time. And and you know, we've been around for 200 plus years, so whatever rules, as long as they settle in, we can operate. But it it was disruptive at the time, and it's going to have implications to how capital raising works uh, in a market that wasn't completely unified yet. Uh, even the promise of the Europe to get to combine capital markets and the uniform capital markets was still in front of us, and now you split two major pieces. So we feel good at what, what we've done. Um, it would have been easier if we didn't have to do it, but that's that's not our choice, and, and now we continue to adjust. Brian, how many times a day do you get asked about U.S. inflation and the Fed? Uh, probably more than we should, because the U.S. has this big, huge economy, which uh, goes and, and moves along. And so, you know, if you think about well, our team uh, at Bank of America's research team, which is one of the best in the world, if not the best in the world, under Candace Browning, Platner leadership team, they basically have a recession predicted beginning of the third quarter this year, third, fourth, and first quarter. But it's a slight recession. It, that the, it goes down a percent or two and then moves back up and then gets back to 1.5% growth in the latter part of next year, but still below trend growth. And so the Fed has to cut off the inflation, and they're clear about that. And you had uh, Chair Powell testify for two days, so I don't, I'm not going to illuminate and, and anything. And the markets were, were all over the yeah. place and on it, the back of that. It will be because they're all trying to figure out. But remember, the big move was zero to where we are now. Yeah. Not, we have 75 basis points more to five and a quarter, five and a half. But yeah. the big move is where we are now, and that is still soaking through the economy. So the most interest rate sensitive pieces of the economy impacted quickly. Housing, the mortgage originations for banks down, uh, other uh, types of financing down. Uh, the capital markets adjusting caused you know the leverage finance and capital markets to close and now they're opening back up and that's that's good but you're getting some stability but that's the intended outcome sucking liquidity out of the system bank deposits going down especially after the massive stimulus that's what they're intending to do and it's happening now the question is how long do you have to wait against a good consumer and employment and things like that but are you surprised at how resilient the US economy was and I remember you know seven eight months ago a lot of the chief executives also of Wall Street Bank saying look there's going to be a tornado it's going to be a really tough you know, economy for the consumer, and actually we have not seen them. Were they wrong, or is it just going to be delayed? Well, it, uh, yeah, it, it, it's going to be delayed. It has been delayed, so that's a fact. But, but the question is, if you look at the American consumer in February, um, so we, we track our all consumers and no. <clears throat> how they spend money, and that's $4, four trillion dollars plus a year, so it's not a small sample. And if you look at what happened in February, it increased over January's rate of year over year growth. It's now, for year to date, it's up to about 8.5%. February is higher than that, in, in, or up to 8%. In February is about 85 to 9%. That means the consumer is accelerating again. And so, so the first thing is the consumer spending across yep. all dimensions. Now, they've moved to services away from goods. The travel experiences, luxury hotel bookings are up a little bit more than regular hotel bookings. You can see all the activities. If you go to the other side of the track, do they have money in their accounts? If you look, high-end consumers, businesses move their money into the direct holding of securities, you know, the wealth management customers, because that's what they do. But if you look at the mass, you know, the general consumers we have, their account balances are still elevated multiples where they were pre-pandemic. And the spending them down, which is a big worry, they're going down. In fact, in February, they rose a little over January. There's some, right. always some so seasonal. you're confident. Actually, so that's the numbers you're they're, they're in good shape. Yeah, they're, they're in good shape. Now, that makes the Fed's job tougher, and yes. that's the dialogue you have about how you can slow it down. But it all comes back to unemployment. Unemployment's low. Yeah. Wage increase 
increases are, are still pretty strong. And you don't see that. New claims for unemployment, we'll see what happens to, uh, this week. But, you know, each week it's hovering at a level. It's very low, and there's some seasonality debate. But it's still very low com if you thought you were really in a recessionary environment. And what's the market reaction function been like? Well, it's been, you know, when rates went up, obviously the adjustment in the marks in last year was not a good year for equities or fixed income, which is very unusual. But if you think about it, you know, the markets then have settled in, and you start to see a little bit of life in the capital markets. The pipelines are are full. You know, you saw some deals get through, and and that's good news. And and yet it's still not close to where it was when it was due. You know, when it was in like. 21 and early 22. But on the other hand, it's stabilizing. And so, yes, there's trading volatility every day, and yes, everything moves around, but the reality is a long-term thing is settling into place that says the Fed's it has to move rates up and has to keep them there longer. That's the piece I think right. Chair Powell's been trying to make people here over the last six months have been, we're going to have to hold them there longer to ensure that we've done the job, even if they don't go as high as people think or a little bit higher yeah. than people think, they've got to hold them there longer. Because do markets understand that? And actually, if, if you see yield back in fixed income, how does that change the whole the whole asset class? Well, it's interesting. Our, our economists have a rate decrease in uh, March of next year, 24. Interesting enough, People forget that in 19, the Fed cut rates. This Fed cut rates when the economy was slowing down. So the question of when they come down the other side is interesting. But our economists, uh, who are a very talented group, believe that they cut rates because they basically will, will have won the war inflation, and then they'll bring it down. Because it's an inverted rate curve is not the normal experience, and they want to get to a real rate curve, but not necessarily an inverted one. You're one of the only Wall Street banks not cutting jobs. Why? Well, we, we have a phrase that we've used for many, many years, let attrition be our friend. And so with 200,000-plus people, you have a normal turnover rate. Uh, we're, actually, it's, it's starting to go down to an all-time low again. So we were, we're running about 12% uh, you know, across the whole base. Going in the pandemic, dropped to 6, worked its way back up, and now it's back down in the mid-single digit, which is terrific, a great place for teammates to work, doing a great job. The reality is you can manage that headcount. And so we'll redeploy people across the franchise, including, including investment bankers to other parts of the franchise to help to help us in the middle market investment banking. So you can move it. Our headcount peaked in January. It's down a few thousand. It, it can move, but you had to yeah. stop hiring, and that's what we had to do last fall. What do you spend most of your time on? Is it a strategy in China? Is it, you know, I don't know if it's fintech or, or chat GPT. Oh, well, <laughs> I, I spend all my time asking questions about all that because, you know, I've got these talented teammates that drive the company. So, you know, all the issues at the moment, how chat GPT will affect. We have this thing called Erica, which is a virtual... <laughs> artificial intelligence, virtual assistant, natural language processing, predictive technology that we've been running for four or five years, and 18 million customers use it 145, 150 million times a quarter. So we're used to it, but this is now a new one that could change the game, and so but we're trying to... do you think it will? I mean, at the moment, you're not allowing it. Are you? Well, we are you aren't using allowing it. We aren't allowing it. That's, a, that's, that's more of a technical sort of uh, security question and how it works and things. The... Use of artificial intelligence and, and uh, predictive technology and stuff. We use not only on the consumer side, but we use that same technology internally. So, but it runs on our data in an environment we can understand. It doesn't have the exfiltration problem and stuff like that. So, it, it's a great thing. It, that'll all work out over time. There'll be licenses and broad internal and work on your own data and then bring data into your things. And it, it, that's just working through the security things. That's the issue of letting a bunch of teammates go out in the public environment and start potentially pulling our data into the public environment without them understanding it. All right, but so it, it will morph into some form that you'll be using basically it, it, internal some in some form, way. Some right. form of these. Uh, it, we already use it. That's what I'm saying. Artificial yeah, yeah. intelligence, you know, we went to Stanford to say, give us a natural language processor yeah. for, for financial services. We built the artificial intelligence. It's worked on the data. We have the insights from yeah. the customers. You know, and you think about it. You could be driving down a car, uh, driving down a road in a car at 60 miles an hour and talk to our mobile app, and it could, it could go to 110 systems and find a specific specific transaction and tell you what it was. That's pretty amazing, but it takes the technology, the yeah. pipes to distribute, the data array, uh, rate, uh, and accurate, and it's, it's pretty wild, but that'll, that's still out in front of us. It also sounds pretty stressful if you're on the wrong side of the trade. Talk to me about China. What, what's your reopening strategy, or what's your strategy in China given the reopening? Well, across the world, we basically do two businesses, uh, corporate investment banking, large companies, and, and capital markets, and, and Hong Kong is a major place for us, and we have in, and on, 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 in China itself, and you know, we're continuing to support the companies that both multinationals doing business in China and uh, uh, large, very large Chinese companies. That's the business strategy we have. We haven't changed that. Uh, 
the atmosphere around it is obviously completely different than it might have been five years ago. But you know, the, and that's something you deal with in the ebbs and flows of the world. But it, right now, it's it's you know, just keep your risk where you want it, keep your operations in good shape, and and make sure you understand what's going on. But how do you look at the, you know the, the regulatory questions, or actually what China wants to do with financial services? You know, they're going to. There's a lot of negotiations that are going to go on between our two countries uh, over time here, and just like Brexit, when a set of rules become understood, we can do it. Right now, there's a set of rules that we operate within, and it's fine. But you know, you wish it wasn't as difficult in some of these countries because of the geopolitics. But that's the reality of being in a business which basically works to reflect the economies of the countries around the world and helps clients. Uh, prosper in them, and, and that's the nature of it. So we're there, but on the other hand, it's a little trickier being there than it was five or six years ago just because of the environment. What, what are you most hopeful about in the next 12 months? I mean, we talk about the Inflation Reduction Act. I mean, there's so much actually going on news-wise. What do you see as a positive? I, I think... What I'm hopeful about is when you see all these companies that we work with, whether it's a sustainable markets initiative under King Charles' leadership or whether it's uh, the, the work we do at the World Economic Forum or the, whether it's the work we do in the business roundtable in the U.S., or you, know, you see all these companies who understand fully that they've got to deliver for society and deliver for the shareholder in driving the changes, whether it's on the environment or other issues. And you know, doing it from a fundamental as a capitalistic basis, that the capital can be redeployed and charity doesn't earn a return. I mean, it's psychographic and impact, but the, the reality is, it, once you I give away the money, this, this is real capitalism money has real. to solve it. And so we did, you know, in, in the sustainable finance area generally, we've done $430 billion in a couple of years, our 10 year program for a trillion and a half. We're averaging 200 plus billion a year. Environments, 230 of that. And, our customers are making the change. Each day I get up and I get a feed of stories and stuff all about all the deals that went on in the environment space. It's amazing what's going on, driven by the private sector. And that's what, that's what gives me huge confidence not only in the next 12 months beyond is the private sector is leading this, which means it has stick to the ribs quality.